This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. We're back with another episode of the Sideline Slice, a winning episode of the Sideline Slice. Alongside Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. 35 to 11, we've got a dub to talk about, Searles. Finally. <laughs> oh, we just needed one so bad. But getting a W at home, night game, Matt Rule home opener, played a very clean, uh, for the most part, clean football game on the offensive side of the ball. The defense looked dominant. Great home opener, great confidence builder. We just got to keep building off of that. Lots to get into. We've got a running back situation to talk about, quarterback situation to talk about. But um, I did just want to go back. The, getting a, a win when we've talked about the psyche and, and how bad this, these guys want to win and maybe doing too much, but to just get in the win column, how, how big is that for a football team? Yeah, just getting the first one. You, ju you just got to get the first one, right? I mean, you want to just get that taste of losing out of your mouth, especially the, in the fashion in which we lost, you know, a walk-off win in Minnesota for them and then dominating on defense for the first half of the CU game just to kind of have it fall apart from turnovers in the second half of that game. So to come out and put a whole game together, run the football effectively, and just winning just gives you confidence. It just gives you confidence. And it's also, I believe I talked about this last year, winning is a high that you always want to chase. Like, there, there is nothing, besides me maybe having my kids, there's nothing else that I, I crave more than that feeling of a big football win. Mm -hmm. Like, just that feeling, that adrenaline rush, that camaraderie, that just that overall exuberation of walking into a locker room after a hard-fought game and, man, going, whew, one in the W column. Right, like there's just nothing like that feeling, and to let these guys get that and get a taste of a dominant win too, I think is just going to really bode well for us in the future. Well, we had talked about how good that uh, Northern Illinois um, defensive front was, but I guess your your big takeaways in the way that the Huskers were able to pull this one out. Yeah, it was running the football. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I know Harburg had some good runs too, but we ran the football effectively with our running backs, you know, and we're going to get into it about how we're going to really miss Gabe Irvin and Ramir Johnson, but every back looked very good. Every back looked like they were in rhythm with the offensive line and the tight ends. The, the guys getting downfield. I mean, Ethan Piper had that great knockout block when he was chasing the ball. I thought that Bryce Benhart and Nuri ran well and did their double teams really well, you know, and just there was hats on hats. And so many times our run game has sputtered or stalled or even had negative plays because it was one guy that was missing the block or one guy fell off the block late or didn't get to the linebacker the second level. And for the most part in this game, we had good hats on hats. Everyone had a good assignment football, and they were finishing with their guys in good body positions. And when you do that, you give your running backs a chance to make a one cut and go. And that's what I saw from our running backs. There was no hesitation. They weren't stuttering in the hole. They trusted their old linemen. They trusted their tight ends. They got pressed the line of scrimmage, made one cut, and got north and south. And when you can run the football effectively like that, it puts so much strain on a defense. How much were you geeking out of that seven-minute drive? Oh, it just spoke to my soul, <laughs> right? Just Especially after watching the Eagles on Thursday Night Football just jam it down the Vikings' throat over and over and over again. You know, just if anytime I can watch an offensive line just get into a groove and get into a rhythm. And we talked about this on my other podcast, the O-line committee that I do. And they go, no, doesn't – everyone always talks about, like, the defensive line getting wore down over the course of a game. Like, doesn't the O-line get wore down? I was like, absolutely not. When you're running the football at someone and you're just beating them off the ball and just moving them backwards, like you get an adrenaline rush and you get going and you start feeling you feeling a swagger and a confidence. And yeah, you might be tired when you get off the field, but there's nothing better than watching D linemen with their hands on hips or having to rotate a fresh four in there in that fifth, sixth play of the drive because you're just beating on them. And I saw that from our O-line. I saw the confidence. I saw the mojo running up to the line of scrimmage. And that really just gave me a lot of confidence for them. Now, granted, I'm not going to sit here and say NIU is Michigan. But, you know, just to get that feeling of what that feels like is something that this O-line and this offense hasn't had in a couple of years. How much does it sometimes take time? As much as this O-line has played together, but it's a new offense and, and – you're still getting Nuri hadn't played last year. Turner's now back at left tackle. I mean, how much does it just maybe take a, a few games to really get into that rhythm for an offensive line? Yeah, new offensive coordinator, new quarterbacks, you know, new type of run scheme. It takes a while to find out what your true identity really is going to be. And, you know, the great news is even with the departure of 
our two studs and Ramir and Gabe with injuries, I think that doesn't really change what the identity of what Satterfield in this offense wants to be, which is a run first offense. And luckily we have a guy like Anthony Grant, who's played a ton of football, who's an extremely tough runner to go in there. And so it does take some time to find your identity. I'm starting to see it more and more on tape of what we want to be and how we want to do it. We started seeing it a lot last week when we were moving the ball against CU of that split zone concept and bringing guys back across the ball to cut the defense and really push the double team's front side and, and escape out the back side. So I think that's really more of what this identity of an inside zone, split zone type of offensive line and running scheme you want to be. And that does take time because you have to really trust as a back, you have to really trust the blocks because it's not going to be there right away. It's going to take some time to develop. And so once it takes some time to develop, then you start to really trust it, then you press it, and then it really starts to come together. And I started seeing that more and more towards the second half and really the end of the first half against NIU. It's interesting you say that because uh, that's been some of the conversations that have been taking place on the sideline with uh, E.J. Barthel and those running backs and, and you know, the Coach Rayola and, and just, again, hey, the lane's going to be there. Just be patient and wait for it. it, it that's something that you, you just learn over time as a running back, right? Yeah, it reps. It just yeah. takes reps, right? And it just reps and reps and reps. And practice is great. You can get a lot of reps in practice, but you can't replicate game speed. You can't replicate getting tackled, running through arm tackles. Those are things that just come with reps in game. And so, yeah, it does take some time to get going. And, I mean, people will say, like, well, what about training camp? I mean, just look at the NFL. The offenses are abysmal in the NFL right now. Besides the Niners, they're just a well-oiled machine. But, you know, you look at – what it takes, it takes time for the offense. Defenses always seem to have the upper hand earlier part in the season. And then as you start hitting later in the season, the offenses start finding their identity, their rhythm, what they're good at and polished at, and how they can start attacking defenses. So I think that building on this game plan, building on this run game, we have kind of the meat and potatoes of what we're going to be. And now we'll start being able to sprinkle in some more odds and ends to really keep the defense on their heels. Well, Ethan Piper, I got to get your take on that pancake because he's mm. on ESPN O linemen were loving it across the country did you see it immediately what did you do when you saw it <laughs> yeah so Emma Emma's had her whole uh, soccer tribe back for the 2013 uh, recognition that they had so we were watching it from the house and of course none of them know what's going on and so I'm watching and I was like did you see that and they're like what that was a good catch I was like no no rewind that and I rewind I was like look at 57 and he just goes out there and just lays that DB <laughs> out and I just I can remember as a player when you're running full speed and it's just like a semi track a semi truck brakes are off there's no stopping right like bug windshield and he just splattered that dude and that was so fun to see that's an attitude play that's the kind where the whole sideline just jumps up and down in excitement about the block not even the run after the catch because that's just what you'd love to see is O linemen hustling downfield peeling guys off the pile smartly Ben Scott you know but like just making sure that you're just continuing because that's an attitude check for the defense too like hey you better not get caught standing around or I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna smoke you one of the things that you've said I feel like every week so far as much as it's been a work in progress but you've liked the physicality of this offensive line so far this season yeah I like what we're doing schematically with getting double teams Right. Anytime you can get double teams, it's, as my dad used to say, numbers don't lie. 600 pounds on 300 pounds, 600 pounds should win. Right. So our double teams have gotten much better with how we run off the ball, our initial footwork with our guards and our tackles, and even our tight ends getting in there and double teaming some of these outside linebackers and these smaller defensive ends have done a great job. And that just allows you to be more physical. Now, what are teams going to do to start combating that? They're going to trigger their linebackers really quickly. Right. And that's one thing NIU didn't really do but watching the teams as we get into Big Ten play, Big Ten linebackers are notorious for being downhill attacking linebackers. And the main point of that is because they don't want you to be able to keep that 600 pounds on that 300 pounder for very long. They want you to get the initial double team fit. They want to plug the gaps. You get off that double team. So I've loved the way that we've ran our double teams and ran off the ball. We're just going to have to get ready to now to adjust and how we want to do things as those linebackers start to plug up in the A gaps and the B gaps. Here we are 10 minutes into the pod, and we've only talked about the whole line. Obviously. <laughs> um, quarterbacks, uh, Heinrich Harburg, how, what did you see out of him? What did you like out of the way he managed the offense on Saturday? Yeah, I loved the style of play. He went in there with, I'm a tough SOB, and I'm going to run over dudes, <laughs> and I don't care if I'm a linebacker. I look like a linebacker running the football, and that's the way I'm going to run it. And I love that physicality that he brought to that position. Now, 
if that's our starting quarterback, I'm going to be like, hey, buddy, you need to learn how to slide because <laughs> that's fun and I love the physicality, but this is a tough league to do that time and time again. Like these linebackers, once they know you're not a slider, they're going to come headhunting, right? But I love that just attitude that he brought to that. And I think that filled everyone else on offense of that physicality attitude. He made some good throws. I thought he made some really good in rhythm to timing throws. That first, cat, that first uh, touchdown throw to Billy Kemp, I thought it was a great timing throw. Knew his read, saw the coverage, put it right on him. You know, the things that he'll need to do a little bit better of moving forward, those deep shots. Right, a few of those deep shots were hard misses, wide misses, miscommunications. You know, those are kind of the next progression of becoming a starting quarterback is letting you know when you can take those shots and being able to capitalize on those shots. But, you know, for the most part, I loved his ball placement. I loved what he did with the football, taking care of it. He did have that one sack there, um, sack fumble at the, uh, in our own red zone. You know, but that's also, it was an RPO. They sent a guy screaming off the edge. It's a tough position to be in when you want to throw it. But, you know, the offensive line's blocking for a run play. Um, but overall, he took care of the football. He ran physical, and he brought an attitude to this offense. He really did. He was, he was confident over there, and the guys believed in him. And one of the guys that really believes in him, and they have got a great connection, which we've seen so far in the, in the two times that they've got to play together, Thomas Fedoni. We're starting to see uh, him get going a little bit. And he told me that... This last week was his best week of practice, and it, it started to click for him a little bit. And I thought he looked a little bit different. His, uh, you know, he's always confident, but just the swagger is back. I, I, you know, I just think people take for granted as good as he is. And, and you mentioned this. You, you tend to think of him as a junior, but really he's a freshman. And, and how long that you've been out of the game, it, it takes so long to get back to that feel. And so I think he's starting to get there, and it just it's a process. But we're starting to see some flashes of how, how big of a weapon he could be. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, he's taken big steps in the run game in his blocking. You know, if you're going to be an every down tight end and you're going to be that true Y out there in 11, 12 personnel, like you never come off the field type of tight end, you start with your ability to inline block. And he's taken big strides from you pull up his tape against Minnesota to you pull up his tape against NIU, and it looks a little bit like a different player. Like you see physicality, you see him trusting his footwork, his aiming points, running off the football. And that, when you can do that as a tight end, allows you to do the things in the passing game, the quick outside screens there. You know, I wish you could have seen him switch the ball into the hand and stiff arm that guy, and he probably would have scored. But that just comes back with feel. And then obviously, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball send Fedoni up the seam and put a great ball on him and allow him to get a touchdown. So the more we can get him involved, the more pressure it will take off this young wideout group, this thin wideout group that we don't have a ton of depth at and allow him to become more of a passer. And, and you saw the connection with Harburg and Fedoni at the end of that CU game as they were going down, plugged him, he got the touchdown. You know, so he's a guy that's just going to continue. Every game he's going to get more confident. And every game he's going to continue to get more balls, and he's going to get open, and he's going to make those contested catches. And if he can just stay on the path in which he's going, he's going to turn into a great weapon for us on offense. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska, has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. Well, we spent the first two episodes of the season talking about the defense, so we're spending a majority of the time talking about the offense here today. But anything new really jump out to you about the way the defense performed uh, on Saturday? Or just the more, more of the, the same? The consistency. The yeah. consistency in which they're playing right now is great. You know, it's a nameless, faceless opponent to them. It could be Michigan, it could be CU, it could be NIU. They're playing with the same tenacity, the same aggressiveness, and really just the same speed all the time. And when you play winning defense like that, you're always going to give yourself a chance to win. And we showed it where we don't turn the ball over four times and we don't give that offense short field. This defense can be smothering. And I know everyone's going to say, oh, it's just NIU. But, you know, that's an NIU team that went into Boston College and beat them, right? Like, that, that's a good NIU. Did they beat them? They might yeah, they beat, beat they beat Boston they did College. Beat, yeah. They did beat Boston yeah. College. Yeah, they dropped one the next week. But, you know, that's a talented group that had some confidence coming in here. But from the word go, Rocky Lombardi, their quarterback number 12, had no answer. Right? He had no answer. He had no ability to go and where to go with the football. The run game wasn't working. I thought that the way that Tony White schemed up blitzes again with Bullock and Reimer and 
guys coming from every direction. And then the unsung hero of this defense right now is Nash Hutmaker. Yeah. That dude is plugging the middle. We talk about double teams. He's not getting moved on double teams. He's pushing the pocket when it's a quick pass game on first and second down. And he's controlling the center line of scrimmage. If he can continue to play at the level he's playing, he will give our linebackers a lot of free runs and a lot of chances to go make big plays. So, so let me just ask you this. So, uh, and again, I know it's always about game planning and, and what you're doing. Defensive coordinator Tony White's going to continue to game plan and scheme, and, and we have the biggest faith and trust in him. But the more that this defense is put on film, and say in Michigan, who's coming up after Louisiana Tech, how, what are the things that they are going to do to try to start – I guess, getting some success against this defense, this Nebraska defense. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest, the biggest uh, crack in the armor when you talk about an aggressive defense is the screen game. And we've been burned on it a couple times. CU hit us on it. NIU tried to get to it but didn't really um, execute it well. Minnesota hit one, a big center, middle tight end screen to us. Michigan's got a lot of good athletes on the edge with receivers and DBs, or excuse me, receivers and running backs. And I think that when you have an aggressive type defense like we have, where we like to blitz and like to get after the passer, the screen game slows all that down. And so I think Michigan's going to look at our defense and early in the game, they're going to go, okay, we're going to get some screen games going. We're going to get some quick passes on the outside and see if these guys can continue to tackle well in space. Because that's one thing our DBs have also been doing really well is tackling in space. A lot of times you see it's cover one, cover zero, no safeties deep, and it's man coverage. And these quick hitting routes have the chance to go the distance if these guys aren't tackling and getting these good uh, wideouts on the ground. And that's a testament to Malcolm Hartsog, Singleton, Omar, Omar Brown, um, Quentin Newsom. Quentin Newsom, like all those dudes. Isaac Gifford. I watched Isaac Gifford put an O lineman on his tail this game, which made me <laughs> even more embarrassed for that guy, but excited for Isaac Gifford. Um, you know, but the physicality which those DBs are playing with um, are is going to have to continue because we're going to get tested on the edges of run after catches with the way we attack the passer. All right, who would you give your game balls to? Uh, Heinrich. Heinrich's going to mm -hmm. definitely get my, Harburg's going to get my game ball. You know, your first start at home, a lot of pressure on you. You're the fan's favorite position, the backup quarterback. You know, so everyone's excited. Think you're going you're gonna to come out there and, and fix everything. And he managed the game well. The moment wasn't too big for him. And he really just took everything in stride. You know, so really excited for him. It shows we have quality depth at the quarterback position for Sims and Harburg because in the way we use our quarterbacks in the run game, it's only a matter of time until one of them gets dinged. And so getting him meaningful reps and meaningful starts is going to give us a great chance regardless of who we go with at starting quarterback moving forward. And, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, I'm just going to give it to everyone. I mean, <laughs> you, you limit – what, you limited that offense to 108 yards? Is that what it was? And, like, I've 20, 26 yards rushing. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible the way that they just – it was a, a total team effort. I mean, they played a ton of guys again. You saw Jim, uh, Jamari Butler got involved in the pass rush, getting a sack. Makai Gabers coming into his own. You know, everyone's starting to really hit stride. And I can't single one guy out on that defense after watching that performance on tape and say that guy was the difference maker. You know, everyone played at extremely high level. They played good team defense, and they really – are the main reason why Harburg was able to go out there and do what he did because NIU, they just couldn't do anything. All right, well, let's uh, talk the tough news of the week is that you lose two running backs. You're one and two running backs on the depth chart, Gabe Irvin and Ramir Johnson. And again, this is a room that you were really high on, the depth there and, and what this offense wants to do. Uh, it's a it's a devastating blow, but you have a guy like Anthony Grant who had a lot of carries last year. They toted the rock a lot last year, almost a thousand yard rusher. And so, and then Emmett Johnson is a guy that they've been real high on, and he had a heck of a high school career. He's really smart. He's really fast. I saw him make a, several good plays in, in fall camp. And then um, Quint Knives, the, the true freshman that it, they were going to try to redshirt, but that might be uh, no more <laughs> at this point. Uh, what are you looking for out of that, that group? Um, can they move forward with the guys that they got, I guess? Yeah, we don't have a chance. We don't have a choice. Yeah. You kind of have to, you know. But, you know, first of all, my heart goes out to those dudes. Yeah. You know, season-ending injuries early in the year are, are just so tough, especially Gabe Irvin finally feeling like he was probably back from that ACL injury. And to have the, another devastating blow like this, my heart goes out to those guys as a former player, knowing where they're at, the frustration, the sadness, the grief, and all of it that pours into. And I know this team will rally around them in a big way and, and really work to get them back to how they can be. And, you know, we talked about the depth of this 
running back room all off season, but I don't think any of us thought we were going to lose two of those debt pieces in one game. Yeah. And, you know, so to lose both those guys, it's, it's as bad as and tough as to say it's next man up mentality. Yep. You know, that's what you have to have as, as a player at any level is, Hey, maybe I was not happy with where I was at the depth chart and I just stayed and did my role. And now I'm the guy, right? Anthony Grant, you're the guy now. Right, you're the dude. You are the bell cow. You are going to get 20 to 25 carries a game now. This team needs you to win this football game. And then you talk about a guy like Emma Johnson, who's like, "Oh, I'm gonna be a role player this year. Maybe get in." Like, dude, you're gonna play a lot of snaps too. And with great, you know, with it's a great opportunity for them. It's a great opportunity for them to go out and get big time reps and big time football. It's gonna bode well for the future of Emma Johnson. You know, I'm really excited. I, I don't trust the true freshman just yet. Um, true freshman running backs tend to have ball security issues because getting hit by Big Ten players and getting hit by 15-year-old high school players are very different things. You know, so working him into this game, I think, is going to be really good before we head into conference play. But it's really going to be the Emmett Johnson, Emmett Johnson and Anthony Grant show moving forward. And I do think we're going to have to lean a little bit more on the quarterback run with either Sims or Harbor going to, as those are going to be kind of the three-headed attack that we have at the running back and quarterback position. Is there something that you could do now knowing that – Again, you, you felt good about the depth at running back, and now all of a sudden you don't, and you have, these, you have one guy that's played a lot, and then you have two guys that haven't. But is there something you can do now, knowing what both Harburg and Sims can do with the feet where you utilize both quarterbacks? Yeah, I, I think there is. You know, I think Sims is going to be the guy still when he's healthy. You know, he's obviously the more veteran guy. He's played a lot of football. And so I think you can see Harburg as kind of a Taysom Hill role, right? We saw that earlier in the year. He caught a ball, lined up at tight end, you know, but now you can put him in the backfield. You could put him on fly sweeps. You can do a lot of different things. You can have a package where Sims splits out and you move him to quarterback, right? I think you will see some more of that, of how they're going to work them in there together in tandem. Um, so, yeah, I think he's going to be a big part of this offense moving forward. I don't think he's just going to be the backup quarterback. I think he's going to have a, a, a bigger role. But you also roll the dice a little bit with that. You know, is it worth putting your backup quarterback out there to be a running back and all of a sudden he gets dinged and now we're down a backup quarterback too. So it's a little bit risk-reward and you kind of have to weigh the two out. But I do think he showed enough in this game against NIU and he'll probably get to play some more in the, against uh, Louisiana this week that he's earned the right to be on the field and help be a difference maker. You and I both agree. Uh, Greg agrees. We've talked about this as much as, uh, you know, people want uh, Heinrich Harburg to be the guy, uh, you know, fans. It, it's Jeff Sims. It's been J Jeff Sims has been the guy and they built this offense around him and they're not going to take away his job because he got hurt. And especially those two games were on the road. Um, he's I guess he practiced pretty good today. It took 55, I think 55 percent of the reps. And so he's progressing along nicely. So um, it's more than likely going to be Jeff Sims. I think you and I both uh, agree that when he's healthy, he will get the ball back. Yeah, it's his team. You know, there was a quarterback competition through training camp. There was plenty that was going on in between there. And, you know, if Harburg was better than Jeff Sims through the entire spring ball through training camp, he would have won the job. Now, Harburg went out and played extremely well. But we don't get to see practices every day. We don't get to see the progression of what those two have done. It is Jeff Sims' football team. I'm a big component that you don't lose your position from an injury. Right? That's kind of something I've always believed in. It's something that's very true in the NFL, too. You know, if you get injured, you don't lose your position due to injury. Now, you can lose your position coming off of injury and not yeah. performing well. That's, I'm not saying that that can't happen, but you can't be like, oh, you rolled your ankle. Sucks, dude. Dex guy's in and you're out. Like, that's not how it works. You, you can lose a team that way. You can really lose a team that way. And Rule knows better. Rule's been around the block from every level, from college to professional. He knows the rules of how things go. But I will say, Sims has been put on notice. Hey, Sims, you don't take care of the football. You don't do the things that we're coaching and we're preaching. Harburg is breathing down your neck. And that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to have competition at every position because it makes everyone better having competition. Yeah, and I was going to say that. I mean, and at this point, now that you've seen what Harburg can do in a game and, and he did it, it's got to give you a little bit more confidence as a coaching staff for if, if an offense needs a jolt or if – turnovers are an issue that you do feel confident in maybe putting in Harburg in a certain situation, right? Yeah, you have way more confidence now. You have more confidence as a coaching staff. Satterfield and Rule have way more confidence now of saying, like, all right, Harburg can be the guy than when he ran in there when Sims got hurt against CU. 
right? When he ran in there, you know, it was kind of like, all right, let's see what we got. Like, we don't know what this is going to be. But now he's got a full game under his belt. He did things the right way. He did things the way he was coached. And so now there's a lot more confidence from the coaching position, the coaching staff, that we can win with Harburg. And if things do go wrong, we won't feel like it's this giant drop-off between Sims and Harburg if we do need to make a change. All right, let's talk Louisiana Tech. Last non-conference game before heading into Michigan and the gauntlet of the Big Ten. What are some of the things that you'll be looking for in this one? This is more of a throwing football team, more of, um, that's what Coach Roll talked about, a you know, different look than what they just saw last week. But what are some of the things that this team needs to tune up, to tweak before they do have Michigan? And, and nobody's looking ahead to Michigan. I mean, I just walked through the facility. It's 1-0 and with the Louisiana Tech logo everywhere. It's all over the building. It is 1-0 this week. We're focused on this week. But for us and for the pinch, for what we want to talk about, what, what are the things that need to happen before the, for the final tune-up before heading into Michigan and the Big Ten? Yeah, you know, I'd love to see us continue to get sacks, right? Finding ways to finish at the quarterback on the defensive side, which then leads to turnovers. You know, if we want to win in the Big Ten, we have to find ways to take the football away. And so I'd love to see us continuing to build off that sack total and getting the quarterback rushed off his reads, off his spot, and allowing our back end that's been very well to go up and get the football when it's in the air. And, you know, so to continue to play tight coverage on the back end against a team that does want to come out and throw the rock. And also, I think Tony White's going to have a great blitz scheme to come against these guys. They like to go out and empty personnel, really empty one out, try and show the cards of the defense. Then that requires guys like Len Hart and Elijah Judy and Ty Robinson to win. And so those guys to continue to polish themselves as rushers. Then you flip it over onto the offensive side, a lot more of the same, a lot more of what we did last week, running the football effectively between the tackles, taking an advantage of some of the deep shots that we can get and finding ways to connect on those, whether it's Marcus Washington, Billy Kemp, Thomas Fedoni, Malachi Coleman, whoever it may be, we need to connect on some deep balls and show opposing defenses in the Big Ten that we have a threat of going down the field. You know, right now, with the way we ran the football last week, every Big Ten coordinator on defense go, all right, safeties. Go put your feet at 11 yards and go plug the hole, right? We'll see if they can beat us over the top. We can't be a we'll see anymore. We have to hit on those deep shots, have some explosive plays down the field to make those safeties respect that and back off a little bit so we can continue the effectiveness of our running game. Should mention um, punting was was back to per the usual with Brian Buschini this week. Had had some pretty good punts that flipped the field, which you always like to talk about, mm -hmm. the, the special teams in the field position there. He, he bounced back. Not, I don't know what all went into not as good of a performance at Colorado, maybe some, some shaky snaps, but um, he, he was solid again on, on Saturday. Yeah, he was great, and he's a weapon. You know, we talked about it. he's a huge weapon for this team. Last year, we need him to be a weapon again this year, so just good execution on special teams, making your kicks, if it's a kick return, put it through the back of the end zone. You know, good operation on snap hold kick, all those things. And, and Bushini is just going to continue to develop. I think he's one of the best punters in the Big Ten. So I knew he was going to get himself back on track. That was not who he was. And I, I know he wasn't happy with his performance against CU. So really good to see him put a new step, a new foot forward and get ready to get rolling. All right, players to watch. I have a feeling where you're going with this one. <laughs> um, you know, players to watch for me. I want to watch Isaac Gifford on defense this week. You know, he's been a guy that's been really close to a few interceptions, really close to getting his hands on the ball, had some good um, blitz rushes. But I want to see him have a big game this week. You know, with a team that wants to put the ball up in the air, he plays that rover position, kind of running around everywhere um, as the eraser, making big hits, making big plays. I'd like to see him get some, get some balls in the air and, and make a difference on defense. Um, and then on offense, obviously, Anthony Grant and Emma Johnson. Those two dudes, you know, it's your time now. It's your time to shine. What are you guys going to do with the football in your hands? But really just don't press it, right? Just trust like we talked about. Let the big plays come. Trust your offensive line. Trust your blockers. Press the hole. Make the cut. Don't try and make the big explosive jumping out to the edge and forcing the big play, right? Just stay with the process. Stay with the scheme. And just hold on to the football. I love it. Hey, you're about to go off the grid, your annual elk hunting trip. Yes, I leave on Wednesday morning. Uh, so, yeah, tomorrow morning uh, I leave to Colorado with my dad for eight weeks. So I'm sure I'll check in with you during uh, this weekend to see how the game went. Or eight days, excuse me, not eight weeks. My wife would kill me. <laughs> um, eight days. So I'll be out chasing bugle and elk in the Rocky Mountains with my dad, and I can't wait. You, you haven't got one, right? 
I did not get one. No, my dad got one two years ago. My buddy's got one last year, so I'm due. It's I'm, your I'm turn. Due, I'm due, I'm due to luck. take down an elk this year. Go get one, buddy. All hey, right, we'll check in with you soon. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cooney. Thanks for watching this edition of the Sideline Slice brought to you by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Go Big Red.